Hello and welcome to As It Comes, life from a musician's point of view. My name's Davina, I'm a freelance cellist based in London, and it's been a busy time here for musicians. The academic year is ending, so a lot of us are cramming in the final lessons before things like end-of-year concerts and exams, plus it's festival season, as well as wedding season. All this means that everyone is busy. Everyone has something to do, especially on Saturdays, because that is our prime working day as musos. I think this was clearly illustrated to me a few weeks ago when I found myself in a bit of a pickle. I was booked to play in a string quartet wedding gig near Oxford, which I had to drive to, and I was running horrendously late due to several accidents on the M25 motorway. Now, if you're not from London and you don't know what the M25 is, then good for you. <laughs> the M25 is an orbital motorway going around London, and it's generally not a very happy place to be. My Google ETA was red and ticking later and later into the future. Meanwhile, I was shrieking voice messages to the violist in the quartet, panicking that I was going to miss the wedding, and then cursing the driver in front of me, who decided that was a fine time to get out of her car and retrieve something from her boot. Faced with the prospect of potentially ruining a couple's very special day, I decided to put the call out to other cellists to see if anyone could cover me. At this point, it was 40 minutes before the pre-ceremony was meant to start, but I thought it was worth a shot. Now, if you're a cellist and I have your number in my phone, there is a very high chance that you received a rather hysterical text message from me, starting with the word HELP in capital letters. <laughs> and of course, no one was free on one of the busiest Saturdays of the year, summer June, just no way. I mean, who's lurking around the Oxfordshire countryside with their cello and a stand? I think I just had to resign to my fate that I was going to be late and arrive midway through the ceremony. I even had a fight or flight moment as traffic was at a standstill just outside a Heathrow airport. I saw a Qatar Airways flight take off and I did think, what if I just flew away to New Zealand now and didn't have to think about this? but obviously realised that was probably not a viable option. I got to the venue, parked the car, and then realised I still had to get into my performance clothes. If you've ever had to get changed in a car before, you'll know it's not very comfortable. What followed was an awkward semi-nudist moment in the car as I threw off my existing clothes into the footwell and hauled on a summer cocktail dress. I went to put on my shoes and realised, curiously, in my left shoe, there was a baby bell cheese. A baby bell cheese. I just thought, well, doesn't this sum up the chaos that is my life? <sighs> I arrived just as the bride was heading down the aisle. In true cellist stealth mode, cello on my back, in my summer dress, and recently cheese-free shoes, I tiptoed towards the quartet, who were at the back under a big tree, and was met with three faces, mouths wide open, whispering, You made it! The challenge didn't end there. Now, I'm used to couples choosing straightforward pieces for their signing of the register, like Pakabar's Canon. Nothing too taxing to distract me from my thoughts about my cat or what I'm going to eat for dinner later. <laughs> this couple had chosen a movement from Borodin's String Quartet, the one that opens with the cello solo. <laughs> I sat up, and despite the circumstances, with all the grace and elegance that I could muster, began to play. Da 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 <laughs> It totally sucked. I'm very lucky that the other people on the gig were nice and understanding, and what was left of my gig was actually really fun. I have to say thanks to all those cellists who got back to me and passed on my message to other cellists. I mean, it didn't work, but nice to know that you guys have got my back. Hopefully, I won't have to do the same thing for you, because I wouldn't wish this experience upon anyone. Anyway, enough of that. Today's chat is part one of my conversation with Madeline Ridd. What a champ. She's a cellist, and we got to know each other well on a tour playing the live soundtrack to Star Wars A New Hope up and down the UK last year. It was so good. I love Star Wars so much. 
We cover many topics in our chat, including chamber music, touring and teaching, but most pertinently, Maddie's struggle with her mental health, which led her to stop playing for several years. This is a topic that I think should resonate with everyone. I mean, you're always hearing about when people get physically sick, because it does happen to everyone. So it would make sense that people get sick mentally as well. Yet it's a hard thing to talk about. I get that. We start our chat, like all good conversations, talking about food. Have a listen to this. I think I'm a fan of the the salty sweet mm. combination. Mm. Um, I think it's quite a new thing. Oh, totally. Yeah. I, I think that it wasn't around so much when we were kids. Mm. Maybe mm. Uh, there's a popcorn at the Hernhill Hill markets that they sell. Uh-huh. It's called Drum and Kernel, and I was obsessed with it. Mm. I think I overdid it because I haven't uh. had it in a little while. But it's a Sometimes really a really nice combination of salty and sweet, but not in a really mm. sickly way. It was mm-hmm. just it was super balanced, mm-hmm. which is. I guess why I really, really liked it. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I think I would veer towards savory mm-hmm. more Interesting. than. Yeah. Interesting. If I've had a bad day and I'm stressed, I will crave chocolate. I will mm-hmm. want um, a brownie or a bit of chocolate. Crisps for me, they're my mm-hmm. downfall. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. I love them. Mm-hmm. Or just uh, fries. Or oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got to do it. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. It's... Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. I should really say thanks for having me. <laughs> <laughs> Well, anyone who brings chocolate into my house is uh, oh, guaranteed a warm welcome. I mean, you can move in as far as I'm concerned. Oh, I know the way to your heart. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> for those listening, we have a lovely selection of green and blacks organic chocolate, which yes. we may tuck into during the course of the interview. Absolutely. If you hear rustling. Maddie might be perusing the recipes. I might indeed. Came. I'm very excited. Yeah. Do you like cooking? I do like cooking. I, I find it really relaxing, actually. Anything creative, I think, particularly when you've got something to show for it at the end, I think can be very satisfying. Do you like the kind of low and slow cooked sort of meal ah interesting my husband goes for long very complicated recipes that sort of take all day Mm. so he'll do homemade pasta for example I bought him a pasta maker and it's about a five hour undertaking it tastes incredible so much fun but it's not a quick fix whereas I'm kind of like okay I'll just chuck things in a pan and have a quick meal Mm. and we've realized that a quick meal that I make will be about sort of half an hour and Nick will make the same thing and it will take an hour and a half so (laughs) I don't know quite how it works out like that but he just takes more care over it I think and uh, yeah I totally think that slow cooked pasta over mm-hmm. like five hours is mm-hmm. amazing for a rainy day but yes. not for when you've just come back from a gig <laughs> exactly exactly <laughs> yes so I thought first of all do you mm-hmm. want to start by telling us what your week has consisted of remarkably it's mm-hmm. Saturday and neither of us are working. I know, isn't this incredible? Yeah. Yes. What a, a rare free Saturday night <laughs> occasion. <laughs> Doesn't happen very often. Yeah. I rather oddly this week I've had a concert on Thursday. I had a lunchtime concert of some chamber music. We were playing Tchaikovsky Souvenir de Florence, which I'd never played really? or even heard before, and it's oh, absolutely stunning. It's so it's absolutely so beautiful. Lush. Yes. Yeah. And any time I do any chamber music, I just think, why am I not doing this every day of my life? I just love it so much. Yeah. The repertoire is incredible, but also there's something about sitting in your chair, playing, looking out at the other faces in your group. It's just such an incredible place to feel that you actually can work. That this can be your work, not just your hobby, but your actual job. I think it's just mm. the most incredible thing. You feel super lucky to super be lucky. in that position. Yes. yes. I had a friend who said that his aim was to be able to do chamber music whenever he liked. So yeah. like, it was yes. his motivation. Yes. Basically, it's like practice get good stable work so that you can be in that position to the just problem play is music. most musicians I think particularly string players would agree that it is one of the richest repertoires and we're just so lucky to have all those incredible quartets quintets sexets but I have tried to get a string quartet off the ground for about 10 years and I meet people and I say do you want to form a string quartet and they're like yeah 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 I would love that and then you sit down with diaries and you try and find time when <laughs> four freelance musicians happen to be free at the same time that's not in the middle of the night yeah and it totally. is it is nearly impossible it is so so hard. it's really really yeah. hard and not only that it's very hard to make a living like that because these lunchtime recitals or um, chamber concerts very rarely pay very well or even sometimes at all and the hours that go into it it's just very very hard it's, to make a living like that it's like a full-time job and yes you can't guarantee a lot of monetary income well at the exactly. end of it. <laughs> yes yes and the hours that you put into learning a part like that really well it's very hard to sustain you can't pay rent on 
it. Let's just oh, say yeah, that. No, totally. <laughs> I mean, my husband's part of a sex tech. Uh-huh, so yes. you can imagine like the nightmare it is to schedule. Oh. And so he's got this WhatsApp group and he'll leave his phone alone for like five minutes. And then yes. all of a sudden, oh, there's 90 messages. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Like, can we do this day? Yeah. Or can we do this day? Or you, you've you set up a rehearsal and you think, fine, we find that time. Great. And then someone will be saying guys I'm so sorry I've had a call from such and such and you think well you can't turn down these great work opportunities so yeah it is very very hard scheduling and it's very hard monetarily but the rewards that you get Mm -hmm. are just beyond amazing so how often do you get to play chamber music well I mean this was the first time I'd done a chamber concert certainly this year and probably for at least most of last year I mean maybe do two or three a year it's not enough mm. sometimes my friends and I just get together and play through the chamber music just for the fun of it and yeah. have a few glasses of wine and you know you think your playing gets better as the evening goes on it probably <laughs> doesn't but uh, y- your inhibitions um, lower yes, I think that's yes. the distinction did I tell you about what we had at our wedding no we had I coined this term I'm really proud of it <laughs> chamber oh man that's amazing <laughs> oh I need so, to do that because obviously I had like fantastic musicians playing in my ceremony yes and then when else are you going to get that many musicians mm. who are available to play and just willing enough i.e. drunk enough to just <laughs> bash through repertoire so oh, we put on our invitations bring your instrument yeah the more the merrier bring mm. any repertoire that you've always wanted to play through there was a piano at the venue that's incredible so we had like multiple trout quintets I feel like I need to get married again now yeah. just so I, I can do well, that well yeah anniversary party yeah Yes. We had, I think the highlight for me was Mendelssohn Octet with 10 players. Oh, wow. That's <laughs> brilliant. Like a bit of doubling going on and Mark yes. was on the double bass on like the second cello part. <laughs> may have panicked oh. when he got to the beginning of the fourth. Oh, <laughs> yes. That, that's quite an exposed cello solo there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. totally. Oh, that yeah. sounds wonderful. No, yes. I love doing that kind of stuff. Yes. Yeah. yes. Well, let's that's do wonderful. that some time. Yes, please. Yeah. yeah. We'll Schubert some, Quintet. Yeah. Two cellos. And we'll do yeah. some cello duets. Oh, yes. It's a shame I didn't bring my cello today. Fabulous. Right. Podcast over then. Yeah. Totally. So you're going to enjoy a nice night off i have a free weekend i've got the chance to catch up with my nephews and new niece it's been put off for the usual reasons of gigs coming in last minute or they've had a bit of family illness but now they're better so i'm going down to see them tomorrow so yes a completely free weekend it's really quite a novelty yeah it's really nice seeing nieces and nephews i just saw my niece in germany two weeks ago and it's such a joy but obviously because all of my um Nibblings. (laughs) Nibblings. <laughs> That's a phrase coined by a friend of mine, Lisa. Nibblings. That is a lovely word. They all live overseas. So oh, obviously yes, course, I have yes. to totally block out you know, mm, those weeks to mm, see them. But yes. it's good dedicated nibbling time. Okay, I won't tell you that I've got to go all the way to Tunbridge Wells in that case. <laughs> I, mean, I can't really complain. Oh, that takes it, nearly an hour by train. Oh, so, gosh. Uh, yeah. it, it does make me laugh. I do have a little bit of a giggle when people say, oh, my parents have got to sit on a train all day. And I'm like, would you like to know how long it takes me to get back to New Zealand? Oh, yeah, I can't complain. It's like cellists complaining that they've got to carry their cellos around on public transport and then yep. you see a double bass come in and you think... Exactly. Yeah, or you're married to one. Yeah, or you're married to one. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So I got to know you on Star Wars tour. Yes, indeed. Which happened at the end of last year. That's correct. And it was yes. a pretty mad. It tour, was mad, but very it? fun. It was very really, fun. really fun. Fabulous music. Yeah. John Williams is just incredible to play. Had very, you played much um, film music? Um, before? I'd done kind of big concerts of John Williams themes, mm. but I'd not done a whole film like that. So um, that was the first score that I'd, I'd learned properly of an entire film. You say um, learnt. Well, I say that. <laughs> I fudged my way through. Um, yeah. Did we? Get the parts beforehand? No, I don't Not believe exactly. we did. No, 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 no. There were some very scary moments. But it was also loud, though. One of the funnest bits of that tour, I think, was in between rehearsal and evening performance, we'd go to the restaurants and we could always spot who was coming to see the film later because yeah. there were all these amazing Star Wars costumes. So people dressed as stormtroopers yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Wookiees. And, uh, and that's us now because we yes. all got T-shirts after it, the yes, show. It's yeah. true. We got the merch. Yeah. I mean, that's my, my, that's my pyjama top now. But I would <laughs> wear it with pride if I ever Go to well, you were a big Star Wars fan before the the tours. A lot yeah, of us I were was. there, kind of. You you weren't so much. Oh, I'd seen them, but I I didn't know every line of every film like in the, I did. in the same way that you did, and, <laughs> and uh, a few of the other members of the orchestra. Yeah. But, uh, Do you feel like you got to know the films better? Yes. Yes, I appreciated it more. I think, particularly with the insight to the music like that. With a repeated performance, if you're on tour or if you're doing a run of things, you you get to have those moments that you look forward to. It's not necessarily cello tunes, but there's you know beautiful moments in the orchestration. You think, oh, that's lovely that theme or yeah, you know that tuba solo that oba moment yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And it's really nice to be in the middle of all mm, that as well. Mm. And to feel so appreciated in the, yes. those arenas as well. That is true. I mean, the response you get at the end of a performance like that is like nothing you normally get as a classical musician because, <laughs> yeah, you know, totally. if you're in somewhere like the Festival Hall or that, you know, the audiences are appreciative, but they're not kind of yelling their heads off and jumping it's up and down appreciative. Restrained applause. <laughs> restrained and, and very maybe dignified. the odd little mm. woo. <laughs> yeah, it's very, very or, polite woo. Do you notice oh. whenever a soloist does an encore or something yes. and it's usually something really quirky to show a bit of a contrast from what yes. they've just performed. Yeah. And it's always something that sends a little ripple of, ooh, yes. <laughs> yeah. throughout the audience. Or sometimes before the applause starts, someone will go, hmm. And then <laughs> just start clapping and it's always a bit kind of... That's a slightly odd voice. Yeah, who yeah. wants to clap first? Yes. Who's going to yes. win? Who's going to call out that bravo before the, the applause? And, yeah. Uh, yes, just get in there slightly before everybody else. So that was a pretty mad tour. Because it was. It, it really tested us. Well, I want to say chillistically. John Williams didn't really use key signatures, did he? No, no. There were lots of accidentals. There were, goodness, yes. And I'm not sure he ever played the cello because there were some huge leaps, weren't there? And yeah. um, very, very exposed, very fast passages like, with no warning. Unidiomatic writing. Yes. But not only did it test us chillistically, but mm-hmm. also mentally and physically. So yes. I want to know what are your strategies for self-maintenance during really busy patches like that one? One of the weird things about being freelance musician is that you will have crazy months where you just think I've, I've barely touched the ground I've been so busy and then you'll have quiet patches when you think I've, I've not had work for ages but when it is crazy like that it is really hard particularly because obviously a lot of our performance is in the evening and you know with very late finishes and you have to be so careful that you are looking after your own health making sure that you have enough sleep I think there's always a pressure in a group particularly if you're perhaps playing with them for the first time there's this pressure that you should be out socializing after the gigs go and out, go, out for, go out for a drink you know and obviously it's really nice to do that but I think as I get older I realize that I don't have to do that I have my circle yeah. of friends I've got a very close-knit group, group of friends it doesn't mean I need to be best friends with everybody in this orchestra during that Star Wars tour we would be in Liverpool one night and then the next day we'd be performing in Bournemouth and there would be oh, like a kind yes. of seven hour coach journey and you think if I'm up all hours of the night after that I'm just going to be a wreck the next night it's going to so, be one really miserable yes, bus ride isn't absolutely it? Yeah. Uh, hungover and miserable <laughs> so I always make sure I'm getting enough sleep I make sure that well I love reading I've always got a good book on the go mm-hmm. I'm making sure I get proper food as well because if you're eating out grabbing food on the go very quickly it's very easy to descend into just you know sandwiches or fast food all the time yeah. you've got to really make sure that you're looking after your nutrition as well that's one um, thing I noticed about you on tour you're very very good at being like right where are we eating yeah <laughs> oh yes <laughs> yes driven, I need a hot meal yeah I need, driven by yes, food yes like, absolutely. I think I'm quite similar as well yes yes or yeah. I will just get hangry you know it's uh yeah that's the worst thing I think I did a concert a few weeks ago where I was totally hangry because mm. they were like oh food will be provided before and after the show mm. and I thought this is brilliant like, <laughs> like bookended by food yes. but it was like tiny food little finger sandwiches mm. with cucumber inside yes. Like there's nothing wrong with that, but it's mm. not really substantial enough. No, and um, what we do is very physical and draining. And if you're hungry on top of that, you're never going to be able to sort of throw yourself into it. Particularly something like the Williams, which is so demanding, as yeah. you've said. I need I need a good good meal inside <laughs> me. It just won't happen. I've done weddings before where they've said, "Oh, we're going to have food provided," mm. and um, and then they've gone along and they've forgotten about us or whatever. And we've been playing and just watching all these this oh, food so go by to the to the guests and then half eaten plates of food go back to you know past us to the kitchen so you think I, I would eat that potato yeah, yeah. please <laughs> I've seen that I've seen food being thrown away before oh, my eyes and yes. it's, it's so depressing mm, I mean it's, it's mm. no good to waste food and it's like come on mm, give it yeah. to the musicians <laughs> I did a wedding once and it was at Raymond Blanc's hotel in Oxford okay and they said oh yes food will be provided and we were like this is great Raymond's going to be <laughs> cooking for us especially it's going to be amazing be the best food ever and then we got there and we got to our break and they brought out these M&S sandwiches oh, and we were so disappointed. disappointing but Raymond where, 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 are, where were you how could you forsake us? <laughs> exactly exactly oh, they didn't spend their wedding budget on giving Raymond Blanc food to the musicians sadly yeah, yeah. Oh, but, you gotta yeah. you gotta feed the crew oh yeah I mean I know this having planned my own wedding and it's mm-hmm. nice for the photographer to eat something because oh, they yes. are and working the music, the entire, absolutely entire time. and musicians make sure they've got alcohol make sure they <laughs> yes <laughs> whatever gets them through yeah. the gig yeah. Although I do not play great if I'm no, 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 a drink. No, no. I mean, no. unless I'm doing chamber rookie at my wedding, yeah, well, which was just a, a total absolutely. laugh kind of thing. Yes. But yes. there are some people that can't go on stage unless they've had a pint or something. That can be really shocking, actually. I mean, I've done I've done gigs where I've arrived 
and I've seen that the players are in the pub mm. and then we've done the show. There's been an interval. They've been in the pub. And then after the show, they're in the pub. And you think, I couldn't play if I was having that much. I, I can't play yeah. on any alcohol, to be honest. And Unless, as you say, it's chamber Rogi. Not, but, only, not um, only that, but how are they not needing to pee well, they, constantly? Exactly. exactly like, yeah. Have they got the most incredible bladder capacity? that's capacity? it. Yes, yes. <laughs> I would, I'd be just running back and forth the whole time. It's not for me, definitely. Yeah. No, definitely yeah. not for yeah. me. I sometimes take, as I'm sure a lot of musicians do, I sometimes take beta blockers for my uh, performance nerves. Oh, right. Okay. And um, I once went to a doctor because I needed my prescription uh, renewed. renewed. Yeah. And um, he said, oh, I'm not sure about beta blockers. Have you thought about just having alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> I really don't think that's a great idea. I didn't think that that would be advice that would come from the a GP. Doctor, no, yeah. no, no like, just get yourself have a you little thought bit about just getting booze. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, and then going on. Like, well, I think I'd be very happy with my performance, but yeah. I'm not sure everyone else would. But, uh, yeah. So speaking of beta blockers, um, mm-hmm. so you've mentioned to me in the past that you took several years off playing. That's correct. Due to struggles with mental health. I'm assuming here there's a bit of a link between the beta blockers <laughs> and that. But I think it's a really important topic that we need to talk about because Absolutely. obviously it's going to resonate with so many listeners. Mm-hmm. And I think that creating more awareness on the topic and opening up that conversation will help us gain more understanding. Oh, I completely agree, yes. So um, can you share with us your story mm-hmm. and what you've done to get back into your playing? I think like a lot of people, when I first started to play, I was very young. I was playing because it brought me a lot of joy and most of us went into music because we loved it. We loved playing with each other. We loved the, the repertoire. We get a huge adrenaline boost, you know, all these wonderful positive things that come along with being a musician. And then as you get older, you realize there's terrible competition, disappointment. It can get so tainted. And that's one of the disadvantages of doing something that you've done basically as a hobby and turning that into a career mm-hmm. is that something that you've loved and enjoyed and you've been doing since you were tiny suddenly gets tainted with all these very negative associations. Certainly in my experience, I was very much big fish, small pond kind of situation. <laughs> I'd gone through school school I'd been one of the more advanced musicians in my school then I'd got out into the real world and I'd I'd never sort of doubted that I was going to be a musician because I it was what I'd always loved I'd started playing when I was four I'd never thought about doing anything else and I just thought it had always been fairly easy for me to do my grades to do my performances and it never occurred to me that I would do anything else sure other than than be a musician it never occurred to me that I would not get a job in an orchestra or become a chamber musician or whatever and then as you get older and you realize quite how many incredible musicians there are out there quite how few jobs there are and how very very competitive it is there's not much money in it all these negatives that I'm sure a lot of people will find very familiar this was a gradual realization for me because I went to university to do music and then I went to music college as a postgraduate so I was alongside people who have had four years of being in a conservatoire Mm -hmm. so they'd been used to this routine where they played all day they practiced they worked on their technique they did nothing else for five six seven hours a day I had never done that so I arrived as a postgrad and I realized I was very very far behind I mean I did music at university but I was not playing seven hours a day because I was studying Studying, I was writing essays I was doing all sorts of other things and so already I felt oh my goodness I'm very far behind all these people I think I'm somebody who works best with a very structured week so at university I was told right you need to write this essay you need to do this you need to come to this lecture on this day and then so there was never time to think you just got on with the work and then I got to music college and I studied at academy and it would be right you have a cello lesson on Monday at two then you have an orchestral rehearsal on Thursday um and maybe a quartet at at the weekend and you're just expected to know what to do with your time what do I do between Monday and Thursday and I knew I was so far behind and I had massive amounts of catching up to do for example I'd never really worked on technique I'd never sort of sat down and spent an hour doing a proper study I was basically learning repertoire because I was a kid I would have my lesson and I'd realized there was so much I needed to do and I just didn't really know where to begin there was so much practice that I clearly should have been doing the task of even starting was so completely overwhelming to me and I think also for me partly it was I'd moved to London I just started to feel very panicked and very very alone because everybody around me seemed to be just practicing doing all these hours and I didn't tell anybody I was struggling and now I really wish I had because (laughs) as you were saying we've got to start talking about this and it really inspires me when people in the public eye who have said they've struggled with mental health you think thank goodness you are talking about it because uh, you know a lot of people do and there's not enough awareness about this and I would have my cello lesson on a Monday I'd come home and I think 
I can't even start playing. I'm just going to go to bed. And I would just go to bed all day, basically. Mm-hmm. I just lost the love of the cello. And, and it was really sad because it was always something that brought me happiness and joy and excitement. It just became, this is a disappointment. I've let people down. I've let myself down. I'm, I don't deserve my place here. I didn't really feel that I belonged when I was at Academy. And London can be very isolating if you're on your yeah. own. And I had friends, but I didn't really talk about what I was going through because they all seemed to be okay. So was and- it kind of like that? feeling of I'm going to stay in bed because Mm -hmm. if I get out of bed then I'll have to try yes if I don't get out of bed then I won't have to I think that's one of the scary things with um, depression is that it's much harder to fight it than to just give into it and it takes if you are already feeling very low and lacking in any kind of energy or motivation just giving into it and letting it feed off itself is much easier just curling up in bed Mm -hmm. pulling the covers over your head than thinking there was stuff I knew that would make me feel better like go for a walk but the thought of even doing that is so exhausting when you don't feel yourself and I just felt so numb I couldn't even articulate what I was going through even to my sister or you know my mum you sort of withdraw completely from yourself and things that used to make you feel happy just don't anymore and I remember after my finals exams people would knock on my door I wouldn't even answer the door Mm. I was just in bed sobbing watching friends because I didn't think Ross and Rachel were going to make it and (laughs) even though I knew they did it was like a sort of physical heaviness around my heart I couldn't bring myself to kind of get out of bed speaking now as somebody who's been through therapy I had an amazing therapist and who's gradually got back into playing and it's much much happier and I wish now looking back that I talked to other friends because some people were going through something similar or something worse something not so bad also that I think a lot of people going through mental health sort of think well some people have it so much worse than I do I, I I mean I never at any point felt suicidal and I thought well it could be so much worse I don't have the right to feel what I'm feeling and then you start beating yourself up about yeah, it yeah yeah and then that guilt comes in that guilt it? comes in yeah. and you think this is a massive first world problem I'm very lucky and very privileged <laughs> to be where I am now I don't have any right and then you realize nobody has a monopoly on suffering I don't think anybody can say this is the only person who is entitled to feel this way because they've had this this and this happening yeah you know if somebody has a bereavement you sort of think well of course they're sad they've lost their mum or whatever but somebody might just be going through something really really tough you don't know about it Mm. and in fact it's one of sorry going off topic but it's one of my pet peeves that people look at other people's lives and they say oh look at them they've never had a a hard day's work in their life they've gone through life they've had a silver spoon in their mouth and you think you have no idea what private agonies people are going through it's classic grass Mm. is always greener nobody has that on suffering you know you're allowed to feel suffering whatever your circumstances and it's very hard at that time to not think this is a permanent state you know it's not gonna get better so when did you realize you might be getting into this right now but Mm -hmm. when did you seek help it took me a few years I mean this was gradually coming on from the age of about 21 and I was about 23 or 24 before I started going to therapy properly I found the most amazing therapist and And was that something you did of your own volition it took me a year or two to even talk to my mum about it I mean I I talked a little bit to my sister and they were very supportive and very encouraging of therapy and I remember the first time my sister said to me I think you're probably a bit depressed it was such a shock to hear those Mm -hmm. words I actually burst into tears it's never even occurred to me but of course that's what it yeah, is exactly. you know, it's... because I think there still is that stigma yes. surrounding that word yeah. um, in yeah. society and people say I'm yes. depressed and it's yes. like either you say it really flippantly like I'm, yes. I'm a bit sad today oh, yeah, exactly. or it's like you're on the verge of suicide uh, yeah exactly kind of n- yeah yeah and it is as always as with everything it's a spectrum and people sort of think oh she's having a bad day and think well no she hasn't been able to get up for the last week or yeah. you know I can't talk to my friends I'm sobbing down the phone at my mum you know when I came out of academy and I went on some auditions this was part of what spiraled into my feeling so bad about the playing was I went on some auditions I got absolutely nowhere I felt just like the bottom of the pile in terms of musicians and I remember doing the one that really pushed me over the edge I went I think it was for Opera North up in Leeds and I went up and I was playing the Haydn D cello concerto which is just an absolute pig it's just so so hard to play (laughs) and I went in and I went into the warm-up room which was this huge hall with about 20 other cellists all playing the the Haydn D way better than I had gone all the way to Leeds I had to stay overnight the night before and I was just like this is it I cannot deal with this I mean yeah yeah, god we could spend uh, a another podcast episode just talking <laughs> about like D. horrific audition <laughs> stories horrific auditions, but yes. I've definitely been in those situations mm. and it does not do 
wonders for your self-esteem really because obviously really you're going to be looking at things that other people are doing and think, oh, yes. they've got really, really nice vibrato. Exactly. Or, or, like, yes. oh, their or they don't even seem really, to be really nervous. Or, yeah, but, yes. they're, but I guess you just kind of have to remember that they're probably looking at you and thinking, she's amazing or something, yeah. hopefully. Great earrings, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I decided I'd done a few auditions I hadn't got anywhere and I decided I just cannot hack this so I basically put my cello to bed Mm -hmm. and I needed to do something because I had to pay rent I had to buy my groceries and I sort of fell into the teaching because it was the thing that was available to me and um, I needed to make a living and I ended up really enjoying it and loving it and it became my career for for most of my 20s. So what sort of teaching were you doing during this Um, time? The first job I got was directly opposite the Royal Academy where I'd studied um, teaching in a (laughs) girls school and then gradually I started doing some private students a mixture of piano lessons and cello lessons and I love the rapport you can get working with children you can get such a very special connection when you're one-on-one kind of scenario like that I think it's very different from teaching in a classroom which I could never do by the way um standing up in front of 30 (laughs) kids probably some of whom don't want to be there and haven't chosen to do music or and in in terms of that uh, the discipline just absolutely terrifies me but when you're one-on-one most of the kids you come across want to be there are very happy to be learning and I don't really mind what their ability is if they want to be there and they're excited to be playing the cello be playing the piano whatever it is I will get a lot of joy you'll from that. feed from that energy yes, yes. This is going slightly off topic, but mm-hmm. how do you deal with students that are super, super keen, but don't mm-hmm. seem to be making any progress at all? Yes, that can be tricky. Asking for a friend. <laughs> I always think you've got to find something positive to say when someone has played something and if they've clearly practiced there's going to be something you can say that is good that bit was in tune you did the right bow there you didn't fall off your chair you know um, there's always something that you can say personally I never responded to teachers who were negative the whole time I didn't want to work for them I think when you become a teacher you remember the teachers that really inspired you mm-hmm. what was it what made me want to learn the cello for patience example for patience <laughs> good sense of humor all these things not being talked down to teachers who made you feel that you were an equal and you want to please them I had was fortunate enough to have many incredible cello teachers but a key one for me was this lady called Mavis who taught me between the age of eight and 13 and she was kind of the first person who made me think oh I want to do this as a living who really encouraged me and she's now in her 80s and I go to see her a couple of times a year and she's just the most inspiring lady and I would love to be the Mavis for some of my (laughs) students if they're still wanting to keep in touch with me when I'm in my 80s I will think that is an amazing legacy to have. Well I do Um, remember when we were on tour on Mm-hmm. in Leeds you yeah. had a previous student that come is to true that is true my very lovely ex-student Celine who I taught from the age of about seven till she left school at 18 that's incredible I've um, never had that longevity with a student mm. but partly because I keep moving countries and discerning students Aww. but I think that must be such a lovely feeling to it have. is unbelievably rewarding to see somebody blossom into this confident young woman who's now at university and doing incredibly well and who got to grade eight cello by the end of her time and I feel that's just the most incredible connection you can have yes it's a real privilege to see people blossom like that Mm. and whether or not they want to become musicians I think I realized as I did more teaching it's not the point that they've all got to then go on and be musicians or you've failed at your job there is so much that people can get from music lessons whether it's learning to listen properly to each other to appreciate other people's skills for some people who don't excel academically it's a chance for them to have another skill that can be appreciated by their peers by their teachers for some it's the social side they've got one-on-one attention from somebody who is talking directly to you who will be there to listen to you and to collaborate who's there to collaborate exactly and encourage you it's so important that we keep that going and when we're teaching we're not just producing musicians we're producing audiences for concerts in the future yeah we're ensuring that classical music keeps going this incredible tradition that we yeah, are that music has privileged to be part of an appreciation in the Absolutely. future because yes. otherwise otherwise who's going to come well to these exactly concerts, government know? is being <laughs> uh, government funding is being cut music services are disappearing around the country music lessons are being reduced in schools to you know an hour a week or whatever so we do have a responsibility to keep that going i think yeah we do have to remember throughout all the challenges of teaching mm-hmm. it is a privilege to be there because yes. you are playing such an important part yes. in society yes while you're not directly bringing up these children 
you're mm-hmm. just helping them function better in society. You yes. Hope. And I get students in their 40s and 50s who perhaps have had a family or a, or a career break or whatever, and they want to go back to their instrument. They say, I love playing the cello when I was little, but I haven't played since I was 15. And we kindle that romance that I had with the cello. And, and that's lovely as well, because yeah. as I said, you don't have to be creating professional musicians to have an impact as a teacher. It's really, really special to teach those students who are just loving it. You know, yeah. there's no kind of end goal in sight mm. apart from just to enjoy. It's almost like practicing a, a form of mindfulness isn't it mm, they're just in, enjoying yes. being in the moment I also think going back uh, for a minute to the mental health side of things I think it doesn't surprise me that so many people in the arts musicians uh, artists actors have struggled with mental health because in this sort of line of work you are encouraged to be very in touch with your emotions in front of an audience you're basically just showing this very very vulnerable side of you so it's not surprising that we feel things very keenly and I think we feel the ups as much as the downs I think it makes us empathetic people that are hopefully approachable as teachers but also as friends as partners that being in touch with your emotions and being able to be vulnerable with your emotions it whether it's feeling something and making you really sad it can also be a very positive thing because um absolutely well we're not repressed we've seen repressed musicians Mm. and i wouldn't exactly say they give the most inspiring performances on the teaching students note it is also worth it for some of the hilarious things that children say to you they do come (laughs) up with the most wonderful things because I would never laugh at a child I think it was just such a horrible thing to do you've got to really you know, keep a straight face but sometimes it is tempting to just give in so. can you share some good teaching moments one of my little students who I've taught for two years let's call her Martha I was just talking to her about her cello and, and I was like oh yes and with my cello I sometimes do this blah 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 blah, blah. and when I said the words my cello her jaw just dropped and she was staring at me like eyes bulging out of her head and I was like what what is it she's mm-hmm. like do you play the cello? Yeah. I was like, Martha, I've been teaching you cello for the last two years. How have you not worked out that playing the cello? And she was like, well, I know you're a cello teacher. I just didn't realise that you played the cello. But have, <laughs> what? Has she not uh, even witnessed you? Yes, yes. I mean, just in her mind, obviously, that's a separation a that you thing. can be a cello teacher, but not actually play the instrument. Wow. How has she approached her lessons now? I think she's perhaps got a renewed respect that I do actually play what I'm teaching. But uh, <laughs> yes. On another occasion, she said to me, Miss, you look different today. Have you had a shower? Oh, Um, (laughs) I get that kind of thing quite a lot. You're like, "Hmm." yeah, Um, totally. Like teaching is one of those things that music college doesn't always prepare you for. Yes, like the number of times I've had to coax small children out yes. from under tables or couches oh, or something yes and it's like yeah I don't remember this lecture yes <laughs> yes on child coaxing yes yeah and how do you find teaching children compared to teaching adults that's an interesting question obviously with adults you don't have to watch what you're saying you have to be careful with children obviously because you don't want to swear or anything like that but you, yeah. you, they do take everything very seriously so you have to be careful sometimes how far you take a joke how literally you mean things there's a relaxation that can come in when you're with an adult mm. and again adults probably even more than children have very much chosen to be there and want to be there and I think one big thing for me was that when I first got together with my husband he hadn't really learned any music before and he said oh could you give me some piano lessons and I was like he's just trying to win brownie points you know he's trying to get to my good moods. but he, he ended up really enjoying it and it's a a whole new hobby for him that he never had sort of access to before and that's been really nice and what he really enjoys is the theory side of things so the the rules and the the mathematics of it things like the cycle of fifths or the sharps and flats all these rules which you normally have to really force on to the children because they really just yeah. can't be bothered with They just want to play like yeah. pieces and stuff. I find this yes. with adults as well. I had one adult student who had never done any music before mm. when he was younger. Never even played any sports before. Like mm. he really struggled with the kind of hand-eye coordination or just coordination in general. And I was talking about octaves. Mm. And I was like, okay, so you put your first finger down on the G string <laughs> and that's low A and then you have your open A and that's mm. an octave. Can mm-hmm. you hear how it's the same note? One is higher and one is mm-hmm. lower. Mm-hmm. And he just very honestly like said back to me, no, oh, I can't yes, hear that. And yes. then you're just faced in this situation where you think, mm. how do I explain this? And exactly. I remember like having to draw like sound waves and stuff. Oh, and I was like, yes. okay, so this one is, let's say this one here is 440. And this yes. one, it got very, very scientific. Yes. And it was... Perhaps you could tell me about that actually. Well, no, I, I don't think I can. I could really um... <laughs> use a bit more knowledge on that side of things. Yeah. We'll see how that goes. My research is still pending. I'll get out the chalkboard. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it really challenges you to come up with different approaches in your teaching. Absolutely. It? And something that works with one child won't work with the next. And you're constantly having to sort of re 
invent your approach if a child is struggling with something you think well how was this explained to me what method did my teacher yeah. use and but that's um, the thing what do you do if you don't remember mm-hmm. for example I don't really remember learning vibrato I remember studying it in depth when I mm. got to like college level etc yes. but like when you're younger and mm. you're just kind of doing it that's an interesting one because I have kids who just watch and copy mm. and and you're like how, how did you do that <laughs> I've never even discussed vibrato and you've obviously just watched me do it and then you've done it and then I've had kids who have just struggled for months on end who won't get anywhere and I do exercise after exercise and it just doesn't happen for them it's like long jump you know some people can do it and some people can't I can't just for the record I've not tried (laughs) oh but who knows maybe that's my secret talent there are loads of things that I think we take for granted as performing musicians Mm -hmm. that Mm -hmm. yeah sure we know to do that and you have to be careful not to skim over that information yes definitely yes I mean even just explaining to them that there are multiple d's they're like but no the D is my open D string. Well, actually, yeah. it's also four in the... No, 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 no. Yeah, it's my open D string. Yeah. And then trying to explain to them that you've got naturals sometimes that are twos and sharps that are sometimes that are twos, that are threes. Oh, my goodness. I don't even know. And then sometimes a two is a flat and three is a natural. Yeah. And, and yeah. The fact that a note is a particular location on a string, yes. not a finger. Yes. Yeah. Yes. That is a big one, isn't yes, it? Yes, absolutely. Like, yes. Oh, what note is that? Two. And it's like, that's no. not a note. Give me a note name, yes. please. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's tricky. Cliffhanger! I hope you found part one of our chat interesting or heard something you could relate to. Part two is out next week, so you'll hear all about how Maddie got back into her playing, and then some. This week's Music College Didn't Prepare Me comes from an anonymous contributor from New Zealand who didn't want to be named. Due to New Zealand being a small country and Tonga, the subject of this story, being an even smaller country. Music College didn't prepare me for that time. I'd been booked to play as part of an orchestra of New Zealand musicians at a major royal event in Tonga. If you don't know, Tonga is a small island nation in the Pacific. It's a couple hours flight away from New Zealand. The first hint of disorganisation came when the fixer in New Zealand had no idea when we were flying out to said event, and at about 8.30 during an evening rehearsal, he got off the phone to the Tongan representative and asked if we'd all be comfortable flying out in about five hours' time. The answer was an obvious no. (laughs) When we eventually got there a couple days later, they put us on buses to take us to where we were playing, and the buses, unfortunately, took us to the wrong palace. Before we realised this mistake, the buses left. Finding ourselves deserted, we tried to make our situation known to someone who could help us, but no one seemed to be in charge. Resigned to the fact that by this point we'd missed our gig at the other palace, we tried to get some food, because it was about nine in the evening, and we hadn't eaten anything since the tiny snack on the plane at lunch. It was a major dinner event with several international heads of state, including the Kiwi Prime Minister at the time, Helen Clark, so we could see lots of delicious looking food, but no one would feed us because all the food was destined for more important people. Funnily enough, although they couldn't feed us, they could organise lots of wine to give us, resulting in very few memories of the rest of the night, a missed gig in a foreign country and a slow start to the next day. The rest of the trip went without a hitch. We played our next gig as planned, but no one seemed to notice that the entire orchestra had gone missing the night before. They even paid for us to stay an extra day and took us on an island day trip. Thank you, Anonymous Contributor, for that insight into orchestra work in Tonga. I myself have been on another trip to Tonga with a group of Kiwi musicians, and I could start up another podcast with stories from that trip. Wow. If you have an experience that Music College didn't prepare you for, tell me. You can email me at asitcomespodcast at gmail.com or send me a message on Facebook or Instagram at asitcomespod. That's it for today. Special thanks to Roz Nagy for my logo and Dan Elms for my jingle. And thank you for listening. Like and follow the pod on Facebook and Instagram at asitcomespod. Remember to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts and spread the word. Chat to you soon. Bye.